Hello, everybody. So I'm Gule Saman, and you can call me Saman for this session. I work at Harriet Watt University on the Data Science Graduate Apprenticeship Program, and I'm joined by my colleague who would be introducing herself. Hello, my name is Heba, and uh, yeah, Saman is the boss. We work together. Uh, we are we working on the Data Science Graduate Apprenticeship, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we'll have now. Uh, thank you, Hiba. So uh, like you guys know, we work on the graduate apprenticeship program, and I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it, but we have like a diverse set of students on our program. Uh, some of the students are school leavers. Some of the students have uh, significant experience, 15 to 20 years of experience um, in the roles that they are working in. Uh, so they're quite familiar with the organizational terrain and with the concepts that are used in their workplace. Um, so in this session, we are basically trying to aim to uh, learn from you guys. Uh, like Fiona said, in an active learning session, what do you expect? So it's you guys who are going to be doing the mo most of the talking while uh, talking while we be facilitating you. Uh, so we want to discuss some practical strategies in order to keep our students actively engaged throughout the learning and teaching process, regardless of their um, academic backgrounds. So like I said, some of them are school leavers, some of them have significant, uh, you know, uh, professional experience. Some of for some of our students, it's their second degree. Um, some, uh, you know, so it's like a dive. Some are very good at programming, others are not so good. So everybody has different skill sets. And in order to keep our teaching uh, engaging for them, relevant for them, uh, it's quite a challenge for us. So, uh, but at the end of the day, because, you know, the students are, are the center of our focus, uh, we want to improve their overall student experience because they come to us to get some new skills, to learn some new skills, and we want to give them those um, uh, skills, right? Um, I would say that an analogy that you would have for our graduate apprentices is people who are returning to education. So, uh, you know, um, yeah, so uh, we want to, and because we teach on the data science program, so it's very relevant to um, STEM teaching. Um, so we have got, uh, uh, we have set up a Padlet for you guys, um, where we have put in some questions um, uh, for you guys to contribute towards. So I, I'll just go over the questions that we have got, and then we can go over to the Padlet where you could contribute your um, responses. So the first theme that we have, or the first question that we have is, how to ensure student engagement in such a setting? Also, I would like to point out that our students, um, we offer them the hybrid approach. So some of them attend in person, others join online. Um, and some might not be joining some sessions, so they listen to the recordings that we have for our uh, for our lectures. So I, I guess I've given you enough of a background uh, for the problem that we have here, uh, which is to come up with strategies for student success on our graduate apprenticeship program. Uh, so the first question is how to ensure student engagement. And then we also are interested in knowing how can we increase and maintain our student interaction in live sessions, as well as, you know, those of us, those that are joining us in online. Uh, generative AI is quite, quite in fashion these days, discussions around generative AI. So uh, just to consider whether we, we consider generative AI as a friend or a foe in the learning and teaching process. And we're also interested in, you know, looking at techniques that would help us in maximizing our student learning. Uh, what would we consider as uh, good practice for academics and what would be the essence of good practice for academics? And last but not the least, how should we, this, the techniques, the methods, the strategy that we should, um, you know, keep in our bags uh, for maintaining our well-being and good health as well. Um, so would it be possible to, um, so I, somehow I can't see my chat option. Uh, so if you guys could log into uh, the Padlet, uh, 
Uh, and the password that we have for our Padlet is ALN24. Um, if you could take five minutes, uh, sorry, seven, about seven minutes to, you know, uh, write in your thoughts on the Padlet, that would be great. Thank you. Hi, can I just ask a couple of questions? Sure. Oh, firstly, sorry, uh, first thing about just about that um, task, is that for all of the seven minutes to answer each of the questions or one of the? Seven minutes for the whole thing. So any okay, comments cool. that you have, pop them in under the, the relevant topic. Fine. Also, so it's a graduate apprenticeship program, So, and it's hybrid. How many days per week is that for the students? One day a week. So depending on the year they're in, either they're in on a Monday or a Friday. Okay. So they have like lectures from nine to five. Nine to five, but one day a week, nine to five, and they may or may not be in the same online. They may be online or they may be face to face. Yes. Um, what's the split? It varies from day to day. <laughs> so, uh, there are a lot of factors that contribute to that, weather being the first okay. one. If it's a terrible weather, you know, if it's a stormy day, they wouldn't uh, come in. Uh, but mostly, f it also depends on the batch that we have got. So those that started their program during the pandemic, they prefer, most of them prefer to stay online. So it would be like 80-20 split or sometimes 90-10 split. Uh, so 90% are online, 10% are in person. But those that started the degree program after, you know, uh, the restrictions were lifted, uh, it's, it, you could say it's a, sometimes 60-40 split, sometimes a 50-50 split. So it depends. Okay, thank you. Welcome. <laughs> and time's up. <laughs> Uh, that's okay, Marie. You've you, you've not missed anything as such. Uh, so we are just adding comments to uh, a Padlet right now. Uh, in fact, we have finished the comments. But if you want to access the Padlet, I've put the link in the chat and also the password in the chat so you can uh, access it. Okay, uh, so like Hiba said, we have got really some very, very interesting uh, comments um, on each of the questions, the themes that we had, you know, um, highlighted. So the first one was um, how to ensure um, uh, student engagement. Um, there are some, um, I mean, as I said, they're quite uh, interesting, uh, but a couple that I would like to, you know, the the very um, the ones that are given at the start. So there's one which says uh, use real world examples. So uh, just to clarify things, we do try to use real world examples and ask students whether they have something, uh, whether they have done something relevant at work, uh, which is similar to what we are talking about. So uh, we we do that. Uh, but there's a comment which I, I I personally would like to explore is present results in class. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. What kind of results are we talking about? It's the very first one. That's me, actually. Yeah. Hey, I, 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 I probably lost some of the context of this. Um, I just uh, jumped in from a meet. From meeting, but I, I was I was involved with a um, graduate um, NHS first year um, apprentices. Mm -hmm. So the um, I think it's equivalent to a foundation level of a degree. I'm not yeah. sure uh, what it is, but I found um, had to be really pragmatic uh, to be meaningful, and uh, how it impacted something at work, mm -hmm. and then. If you've got people to work on that in that in that particular time, yeah. there's people under a lot of pressure anyway. So you get them to work on that and then present to each other. Mm -hmm. That was um yeah, one way of 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 you know in all pragmatism, you know, uh um the students are really engaged anyway. But the yeah. the main point was 
is is to make that strong link between between theory and practice and get people to work together on something they could identify with. There's always, there's always a background of um, whether something's available to work on at work mm -hmm. and what and what the implications of that are, and also the management implications of that. Yes, because you've got to manage that in the background, and you've got overheads and uh, and continuity and availability of data and all sorts of things which get in the way. So. Um, but but that 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 link to practice and getting people to share share their uh, war wounds, as it were, you know, the you know their, their difficulties in mm -hmm. in the subject uh, uh, in practice was really value re rewarding for them. So that was uh, that was an important point took away from that. Yes. So I have a question for you: Were all your apprentices from NHS, or were they coming from? Did they come from different professional settings? Um, all NHS, but all from different parts of the NHS. Yeah. So sort of diverse backgrounds in terms of their functions, yeah. which parts of the NHS were, were they were supporting. Um, yeah. Some had master's degrees, some didn't. Some had no degrees. Some uh, There's one person who's involved in research, mm -hmm. others involved in administration. Mm -hmm. So it's really, they're all really different perspective on a complex organisation. And mm. the, the uniqueness of that was bringing people together yes. uh, in that context of a complex organisation and getting them to to share, yes, this is a problem. It's almost like giving them some sort of expression yes. through uh, an academic lens, uh, filter, I guess. Uh, uh, if, if you try it overloaded with theoretical yes. concepts, which was removed from the, you know, that, that, that problem space, which is so rich for them, yeah. Didn't make sense, you know, and that, that would lose engagement because then you would start to question why we're we doing this, you know, and uh, yeah. straight away. And, and people are under a lot of pressure, time and money, and, and all sorts of other things. And, and, yeah. and interestingly, you know, people involved in different levels of severity of cases, you know, uh, which which puts meaning onto what they're doing straight away. You know, why am I doing this? I'm dealing with severe cases at work. You're asking me to do a theoretical exercise in a class, which is removed from what I'm doing. So yeah. that just didn't make sense anyway. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. so yeah, we, had, we had similar kind of challenges that you have, um, the, you know, the same degree apprenticeship or project degree apprenticeship, mm -hmm. but they are working in different contexts. Yes. Um, sometimes, and I had that with town planning, uh, that was a postgraduate or graduate one, uh, where you had a direct route taught together with the degree apprenticeships so the direct route they are not in a pl employment they're not i don't have access to the workplace <laughs> yeah. um so the activities and then the the other dimension i guess uh which is slightly different um more about the mode of delivery is how distributed they are so how far do they need to travel to come to a face-to-face -face meeting yes. uh, so if you have a mixture of that of people who easily can can come in and people yeah. who are miles away um, you then ended end up with something like a online hybrid uh, kind of mix, um, which makes it quite challenging. Yes. So uh, what I take away from this is that if we present to them the application of what we are talking about, that would keep them engaged. Um, the essence of what I have taken away from uh, both what you, um, both of you guys. Um, uh, like like you said, I mean, for us, the, the problem is that our um, GAs, they come from diverse backgrounds as well. So somebody is working in the factor, somebody is working at NHS, somebody is working in the tourism industry. So they're from all over. Um, and, you know, we have to try to balance this. But uh, yes, I believe if you if you present the applications to them, it re it's like the hook. So the hook that you have for like articles or the clickbait that we have for YouTube's videos, you know, it's the hook that they get. And then I think that keeps them engaged. Um, but I don't know if, does it work in every case? Do you think it works in every case? I think the thing is if you get them to present back, so they're, 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 they're getting themselves geared up to, to talk in front of everybody else and share share what they're doing. Rather than, yeah, I, th I think I think uh, preparing for the class, um, 
yeah, it's not. I think there's always there's always that pressure of, of getting people to do too much preparation, and like you say, you can travel in for you could be traveling for miles, and uh, have all sorts of pressure. So you've got to keep them in touch. Uh, it's got to be a pragmatic I thing. I don't know. I don't know, but it's, it, I just know the challenge and how difficult it was to transfer the original ideas and theory. Yes. Um, I mean, I, ideally, you're able to give students a task. They take that into the workplace yeah. and then feedback from that. But again, it depends on um, what what how realistic that is and if they have access to particular things in the workplace. Um, so sometimes it's uh, more about modeling it. So it's, it's authentic learning and scenarios, role plays, case studies, this kind of thing. And maybe then ask students, how does that happen in, in your workplace and feed it back that way? So yeah. students that can apply it to the workplace still um, get the the experience, uh, but it's modeled rather than um in, in real life workplace. Yeah. Yeah. And this opens also conversations with them to get to know each other and what different field they are coming from and how do they deal with the same problem, but in a different scenario and so on. So normally what I try to do is if I'm explaining, as Paul said, if I'm explaining something that's pure theoretical, I'll just ask them to think how they would use it in their workplace if they have already done that. And if not, then having seen it now, they need to think how they can apply it in their workplace. And this gets them to speak up and even speak with each other, even if they don't want to speak with me, uh, but normally they do. So <laughs> that's, um, that's another thing that can be effective as well. Yeah, peer learning, it really has an I think sometimes they consider us maybe like, you know, they're all, they're talking all the time. But if their peer says something, yeah. I think it's quite impactful and, yeah. and they learn quite a bit. And yeah. with apprentices, what I found is it's very important for their engagement when you have these discussions in the classroom or uh, try to get their attention through their peers. And it's not like they don't hold back criticism either. If they yeah. don't agree with something, they would just say it. Yeah. Yes, Fiona, sorry. Yeah, I suppose just to come in on the back of that and to say, I think when people come from a variety of different backgrounds, that's obviously challenging. And I think um, one of the things that we need to do is we need to help people to see what relevance engaging with the other people and helping others to problem solve gives. So even if that particular scenario isn't absolutely in tune with their own work-based background, if they can understand the benefit that they'll get from helping someone else problem solve or engaging in that critical thinking, then there's something in there about relevance for their learning. Um, and, and I suppose it just adds to what you've what you've already said it's not necessarily overcoming the challenge but I think it's another lure if you like to help make the whole session feel or the whole content feel as relevant as it possibly can yes. despite the the diversity that you've got across the, the cohort yes exactly yeah uh, rightly said I mean it's uh, although they come from different backgrounds professional backgrounds academic backgrounds their experiences are very different but then they're also living like a normal, regular life and, you know, real life experiences could, you know, uh, the, the loads that we could relate to. So mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Fiona, for that. Um, so I'm very conscious of time and what, um, what we could accomplish in this one hour. Uh, but one thing that I would like to ask in terms of maintaining um, student interaction, how would you balance the in person and the you know the activities for the people who are um, you know present in, in there in your classroom and those who are there online what kind of activities would you give these two different audiences in order to keep them interacting and engaged Is silence good here? Yeah. Um, I think I think you could do presentations. Um, so you could present in the classroom, be videoed, or you could present at home. Yeah. Um, and you could get questions from the audience. I should imagine. 
Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Ambrose or Cole, what should I? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think in very in many ways it depends on your setup, on on how your room set up, etc. I think if everyone's got laptops and everything, you can form groups where one person within that group is actually online and that sort of thing, and we'll sort of work through teams in some ways. Yes. Yes. Um, in other situations, it makes more sense to have an online group and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it really work, works if you actually think about it beforehand, uh, I think. Um, and I've I, I put down in there as well is, is having a second as well that makes sure that when there are discussions, mm -hmm. the feed, etc., uh, are noticed and those questions come out from the for, from these sort of people who are online, etc. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Fiona? I think with that, you can have a, a student ask to monitor the chat, can't you? Well, yes, well. I, I normally log in on lots of screens in front of me. One screen for the chat, one for the presenting, another one for I don't know what. So I normally have like three screens in front of me, which is not fun to do, but it works. Yeah, yeah. Gives you a headache at the end of the day. Sorry, Fiona. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I've just echo everything that, that's just been said there in terms of the, the design. For me, this is really, really crucial. Um, I don't believe that, that these sessions can be done on the hoof. They need to be really well thought through and really well planned for all the, the reasons there that you just said about understanding the environment yeah. and thinking about whether you've got a group mm -hmm. online. I think there are strategies that can work really well when you've got when you deliberately engage the two sets of learners i think what what, what happens is the challenges sometimes is when we concentrate on one group to the detriment of the other and i think that's a really difficult thing to do i think it requires quite a lot of skill um, yeah. from a tutor's perspective but i suppose there are things that that we can do and um, just following up from that idea of perhaps you know for example having the online group having the on campus group you know i mean the, things like having your, your little round table discussion where you've got everyone competing um in terms of giving questions whether it's hands up or chat or whatever um and then also just strategies like you know fishbowl discussions and things like that things like that can work really well but it really does in my opinion has to be so well thought through and prepared before you start it yes so paul you're on mute i, I found that um been trying to go down this gamification route where thinking about students motivation to learn mm -hmm. seeing it greatly enhanced if you if you have an element of competition involved um and i know mentimeter's got a competitive quiz on it for example yeah if you, have, if you have some some element of the class where everyone competes in a quiz online or something like that and the winner gets something it, it does influence people's engagement through so there's some emotional change mm -hmm. yeah, that, that gets channeled into more learning. And then so, so if you work on a strategy of competition, mm -hmm. um, competitive quizzes, are some, some element of one group, work, groups working against each other. Like, uh, I once saw one designing and building a bridge. Mm -hmm. If you could get that done first, I guess getting something done first or yeah. something like that, um, fine. it just changes the motivation and changes the game somewhat, as it were. Yes. So um, really well put together. I mean, Fiona, the, the key word for me was from what you had said that, yes, strategies, you really need to think them through. But competition was the key word that I, I you know, I would hang on to. And I think Paul has uh, reiterated what you said. One thing that one feedback that I've got from my students, so I used to use Kahoot a lot, but now they've got a restriction on the maximum number of users that you could have for the free version, which is 10. So now you, can, you can't you can use it for bigger um, cohorts. Uh, but students really enjoy that. And the thing is that just the addition of the music in the background, it changes the monotony of mm -hmm. us talking um, and, you know, changing the icons and choosing their avatars and, you know, they play around with it. And it brings life into the room and they just love the competition, although it does not add to their final grade or anything. 
the one that I use, it does not contribute to the final grade, but they really enjoy the competitiveness and, you know, oh, I got more than you, I got less and so on. So, you know, that, that really helps. Yeah. I, I just, I'll, I'll do a quick comment on the Paolo. I hope I'm saying the name correctly. I'm sorry if I'm not. Um, yeah, the anonymous quizzes or group quizzes are good. So you don't need to put your name next to a wrong answer. And I completely yes. agree. The anonymous part works really well. What I sometimes do is because most of the course, my courses are mathematical courses. So you can imagine how <laughs> complicated it, it is when you're designing it for GAs and not for undergrads because they are purely theoretical, but I also need to put the application part in it and get them engaged with it. So I use the whiteboard on Teams. And I, for example, we have a, um, a problem and I ask them to solve it on the whiteboard. So I don't know who's writing what. And some of it can be right. Some of it can be wrong. So, yeah, so the anonymous part is something that that really helps with the interaction because some of them might be shy, you know, to show that they did the wrong answer. So I agree with this comment. Yes, Paul, sorry. Um, I, uh, did, uh, I've been looking at teams recently on I mean, project management. There's an author who says a successful team is one which has been given a very high performance goal. That's the common characteristic. So if you give them something which is very, very challenging, mm -hmm. it, it motivates people to work in a team. Yeah. To get to that high performance goal as 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 distinct from a team which is day to day like like you have day to day teams which are doing something if you give someone a, a very high performance goal uh, design or, i don't know uh, build a new strategy for the university or something you know so, something really stretching and challenging then it does bring people together more yeah. in theory and whether that does that in a teaching and learning environment, I don't know. But maybe it's another motivator it's to just have like a stretch task, perhaps. Um, it's just down to motivation again. Yeah, I, I, I would think of it about inclusivity more. So like to put a problem where they feel that they are in charge rather than... So I understand your point of a stretchy um, point, but I... I think if they feel, and I'm talking here, maybe the undergrads, because the GAs are normally interactive if they are interested in the topic and they know what they're doing. But sometimes the the challenge would be in the, for the undergrads because they are not sure about what they, they need to know and what they don't. So, yeah, so I think when you flip it around and ask them for them to be the lecturers and you're the student and they're explaining it to you, this can also uh, get them to be more interactive. Yeah, um, I agree with that. The challenging bit, I <laughs> want to experiment with that and see how it goes because I've not experimented yeah. with that. Uh, yeah. But I would like to experiment with that. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's time that we move on to the next theme that we have. Do you consider generative AI a friend or foe? There are mixed feelings about it. Some people consider it a friend, others don't. Um, one, so we had this enhancement, academic enhancement review workshop uh, a couple of weeks ago, and one of our colleagues, sadly, he is not with us anymore, uh, said that it just generates a soup of words for us. And the, the way that we had opened that conversation was that if AI builds a bridge for us, would we be willing to cross it or not? Uh, someone has already responded to that comment saying that why not? Um, uh, it can be a starting point. So I, I think you consider it a friend, but what are your thoughts as educators um, on this um, aspect of teaching and learning that has been introduced into the mix now? So I think some of this is kind of split between preventing abuse of it, um, mm -hmm. so cheating kind of thing, and equipping students with the skills to use AI uh, in their context uh, productively. Um, and that means that as a teacher, um, we need to be um, up to date on this. Uh, that's not, not easy. Students often are <laughs> a kind of mile ahead. <laughs> yes. Uh, and then 
make it relevant to the particular um, employability uh, context they're coming from. Mm -hmm. um, Ambrose? Yeah, I totally agree. It's there. It's not going away. Students are going to use it. And anything else, if we try and block it, it's just an arms race sort of thing, isn't it? So <laughs> it's it's a, it, what we've got to do is, is teach students how to use it effectively, how to understand its shortcomings. And at the biggest effect I think it's going to have is it's going to change how we do assessments. Yes. Um, and I think potentially in a positive way, because it will mean we'll have to think about assessments that are really relevant to the skills we're trying to build in those students as we go along. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's a big question at the moment as to how we do that in a scalable manner that, 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 that will work. Yeah. Completely agree with that. So in terms of assessments, that is going to be very challenging for us to design. Are there any thoughts on how could we assess students so that, you know, um, we can assess their learning rather than them producing an essay for us about the topic. How would you modify your assessments? I mean, I think one of the ways is that sort of almost micro assessments as you're going along. So it's developing. So you can see that progress of the student as you go through. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just one thing at, at the end, but you can, you can really see if they've, if they've, Took the, brought things into their to their understanding and you can see how they developed more through the course. Uh, and so that gives you a little bit of sort of resilience to something at the end that, that you can't tell whether it was done by AI or not sort of thing. Yeah. I agree. So the kind of portfolio patchwork text type of assessment, but also um, assessment which are require individual responses. So going back to the authentic activity. So if they basically have to write something uh, respond to a task which they have to uh, check in their work context, mm -hmm. uh, then it's it's not generic. It, it's something that is specific to them and their work context. Um, thank yes, you, Fiona. Fiona. Yeah, and again, I seem to be coming in in the back and just agreeing with everyone, but I'm going to do the same again. I think so as well. I think there's something in there about we can use formative activities to give people opportunities, but then we have to think, ask people to, to self-evaluate what they've learned from those and what they're mm -hmm. going to use to take forward, which then becomes something quite authentic. And if you tie that into the work base of people, then you've got you know a much more authentic assessment that then is a little less open to the abuse that we're talking about um, in the chat there. I do think that we've we've got a, an opportunity here, just not uh, not only to refresh our assessments, but also to think about how innovative we can be and how we can move forward with our learning and teaching strategies. So there's opportunities in here for us to engage students in the use of some of the AI tools, but we have to think about how we do that, how are we going to upskill them to deal with it, to take those skills forward, but also to engage in the kind of critical thinking yeah. So they don't think it's just the most wonderful thing. I mean, as a complete aside, my husband has just been introduced to chat GPT and just thinks it's like some kind of miracle has been bestowed upon him. And we've had numerous conversations over the last week about thinking a little bit critically about it and what could be the ifs, buts and maybes about it. And, uh, you know, it's quite interesting just that this is just something that's come completely new to him, but actually some of our learners are coming completely new to this as well. So I think it's important that we help them try and be rounded and be critical about these tools as well. Yeah. It's very important to be critical about any new technology or any <laughs> new thing that you're being introduced to because you don't know what you're what you're experiencing. Um, have we, so I completely agree with what everybody has said in terms of being innovative with our assessments, continuous assessments, uh, the work-based aspect of our assessments, the reflection aspect of what we have learned. And that's what I've been trying to introduce to one of the courses. So I teach a course on machine learning and um, it's a taught course. So, and it's quite mathematical as well. Um, and what I have been trying to do now in order to, you know, revamp my assessments is to ask them on reflecting what um, they're saying and how they would apply a specific technique. Um, it's not th that aspect of the assessment is not programming or coding, but they need to reflect on it. How about have we considered the inclusivity aspect of it? Would it help in uh, 
being you know our teaching being more inclusive for instance for people who who's um who's not a na- for for someone who's not a native speaker english native speaker or um you know uh in terms of even judging our assessments as well so if i have written a piece of assessment i give it to uh, one of the generative ai platforms and ask it to uh comment on it saying that you know do you think it's appropriate for third year students and so on so in terms of using it uh, for role play so what would your thoughts be on the two things inclusivity and using it as a role play uh engine i think the tools that that are supportive so i use grammarly and recommend that to anyone which has um a language model sitting underneath it um mm-hmm. uh so it's a bit of the gray area but you know whatever makes um your text more readable but you up from the work on that side uh there is a uh, a wider discussion about the digital divide so some of those tools cost money um especially yeah. when you have the newest version or the extended version and that can create digital divides and and i think institution what i hear are still a bit reluctant to invest into um you know institution wide licenses on chat gpt4 or something like this mm-hmm. so i think there's a danger that there's a digital divide opening up um that we have seen during the pandemic as well yeah any other comments i thought uh there would be lots of discussion around generative ai <laughs> if if i will add a, a final comment before we move to the next one I, i i don't consider it as a friend or a foe depending on how you use it and why you're using it so as someone said in one of this enhancement uh, workshops we had the students as well so we asked them the same question and some of them were like yeah if i'm stuck in a piece of code then i would just go in and learn from it and that's the keyword here so they are not just copying the code to get the assessment done but they are trying to understand how did the code work so that they are able to debug the error and then try to solve the problem so if they are using it to learn and in a way which is not just copying and pasting then i consider it as a friend but if if it's the other way around then then no it's not a friend so and i think it's how the students are using it and we need to explain to them because sometimes we also do it like if i'm stuck in a piece of code that i'm writing or if i want to search if there is a code already that someone has implemented and i'm using it and i'm showing them that i'm using the code and this is the source then they they get the idea that okay if she's doing it then i'm allowed to do it so and then we start this conversation like you know because i agree with what you said if we just tell them no they will use it <laughs> whether we like it or not but they need to understand why we're saying that there are some restrictions for the usage of it uh thank you heba so there's a comment about ben uh in the chat uh which talks about a decathlon uh could you do you want to expand a little on that i i quite quite interesting how you um use that for inclusivity um Yes, so can you hear my microphone now as well? Yes. Um cool. So um yes, yeah, so we got now instead of getting to write a final essay at the end, they do um like a short analysis of a scenario and they might do a, a small quiz based on maths questions mm-hmm. and we get them to do a, a presentation to lead a journal club as well. Um mm-hmm. <clears throat> amongst uh, there's actually 18 little bits uh that they do over uh, mm-hmm. over a 12 week period mm-hmm. um to to feed in as opposed to completing a a whole essay at the end mm-hmm. um and so some of them really don't like public speaking um mm-hmm. and sometimes they don't actually even engage with that at all most of them now engage with it because they see it links to their assessment <laughs> um some of them perform significantly better in public speaking than they do in writing um and so it's replaced their uh written performance that they would have got in an exam or in an essay and you can see we ha- we do have some students that get you know f f a plus c or something like that across their different areas um so 
we quite like it in the terms that it actually helps where you've got um, students that are significantly better in, in one area than another. Uh, thank you. That's that's quite insightful. I mean, um, quite useful as well. Um, so something that I would like to point out, so the images that we have got in the Padlet uh, that you guys have been commented commenting on, uh, they've all been generated using generative AI. So, you know, it can be a friend and a foe considering the situation and the circumstances. Um, thank you so much for all your contributions on this. Um, so my very, the last two questions that I have is, can you identify the essence of good practice for you? So what is your absolute go-to thing in order to maintain student engagement and maximize student learning? Just to note, we got about eight minutes left. Yes. About. Yeah, so we have eight minutes. So if somebody would like to contribute to that. I popped something at the bottom, which was specifically about the apprenticeship sort of side, which was making sure that you embed all the elements of the apprenticeship within the course. I think we've made the mistake previously when we first started doing apprenticeships of putting it at the end, so all the information about gateway and these sort of things, and it, it came as a surprise to the students to a large extent. So making sure that preparation is really sort of rolled into the whole course as it goes through. Yeah, we just went through that. Um, we were asked to create training plans which make very explicit how the learning outcomes match the KSBs, um, yeah. all, basically all the way down to activities when yeah. you get to the delivery of it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Marie? Sorry, I just wanted to add something. Um, when it comes to maximizing student learning, mm -hmm. one thing I've learned is because most of apprenticeships they come from very diverse, uh, uh, they have a, a lot of diversity in them. And it's not just about the ethnicity, language and all that. It's even their, their part of experiences. So mm -hmm. I teach on a level seven and some of them have already uh, done mass uh, academic work at level seven. Others are coming from leadership and management position, teaching position. Mm -hmm. So if they encouraging them to share the experiences and then linking the experiences to the content that you're teaching, it will help them more, it will keep them more engaged and almost re relate the content that you're teaching to their own experience. And I found that work with the student and when they are writing the assessment, you can find this reflected back mm -hmm. to the to what it was taught for, uh, through peer learning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So uh, one thing that I've started using uh, since last semester is to use reflective journals. So mm -hmm. whatever we learn, I ask them to put an entry for that topic. And previously, I would have class activities for them, uh, which sometimes they attempted, other times they didn't. Now I have like a small portion, so like 5% of the course mm -hmm. is based on, the course mark is based on those activities. So they have to submit those activities to the reflective journal. So it's like um, a continu continuous assessment, but you know, it's not like a big chunk of, yeah. of the grade. Um, um, so Anybody else would like to contribute to the essence of good practice for them before we move on to the very last bit? Um, okay, so um, how do you maintain your well-being and health? Because, you know, with continuous assessment, being very innovative with your assessments, with your teaching, all that planning that goes into your assessments, um, what do you think um how how should you maintain what would be your piece of advice i like the comments on the on the padlet already like keep things some somewhat simple <laughs> that's a, that's a good one making it achievable keep an hour on student load and hours it's um, bad spelling on my part. I like no, it it's fine. That's fine. And I, I like the give ground rules for feedback and check-ins. That's that's for me something that's that's clicked there because it, yeah, when you put the rules, when you set up the rules, it makes it makes things easier for everyone. 
I don't know if anyone wants to add anything else. Uh, would anybody like to add to that? No? Okay, that's One great minute. then. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, Two minutes. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so just wrapping up, I mean, I've thoroughly enjoyed the discussion. I think for discussions like these, one hour is not sufficient. <laughs> so it's a good starting point. Uh, I hope we can build up on this and uh, work on it further. And perhaps we could come again and share our findings with you next time. Uh, yeah. But just as a bit of uh, a task that we have for you uh, is if you could add to the Padlet, if you have any new thoughts, any new ideas that you that have come to your mind after the discussion that we have had today, um, please do so. But if you're adding a new thought or a new comment, if you could just add after to the start of your comment so that we know that it has come about as a result of the discussion that we have had, that would be great. Uh, and thank you so much. If you want to get in touch about uh, our work uh, with Hiba and myself, uh, you're more than welcome to do so. But please try to add to the Padlet after and what your thoughts are after the discussion that we have had. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much.